So, ooh, be ready because I'm about to scream. Okay, um, how many people have ever been lost before? Come on, be loud and proud. Never been lost before. Lost. Lost. Driving. Okay. So when I first started dating Sarah, um, that's my wife now, um, didn't get that lost, thank the Lord. That was a side note. Okay. When I was first, uh, was first was dating Sarah, the time came when it was time to meet her parents. And uh, so I decided I got to drive over there, and uh, she wanted me to come over and, and just do that quick introduction, right? So I went over there and uh, was really nervous, obviously, um, and uh, met her parents. And you know that thing where you're like, he didn't shake my hand firmly. Like, does he really like me, or is that a sign? She looked at me funny. She asked me what my name was. Like, you know, thinking all these things that could go wrong. And so I got there, and I met them and thought they hated me. And then she was like, okay, you know, um, do you need directions out of the neighborhood? And I was just so ready to just get out of there, right? So I was like, no, I got it. It's cool. And I hopped in my car, and I started driving. And 30 minutes later, I realized I'm lost, right? And the little neighborhood, it's not that big, but every turn looked the same. I'm just like, this is going crazy. And I got to one point where it was just like this. There was a, there was a yard across the way, and I could see the street that I was trying to get to, but I couldn't go through. And I, this is crazy. And uh, it may be your neighborhood, but I was, I was lost. I was lost, and I hated it. I hate it. When I get lost, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I remember the Lord. Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Relax. I hate it. It stresses me out. Why? Because it's scary, right? It's kind of scary when you get lost. And so the reality was that that night I got lost. And the truth is tonight where we want to go and as we move through Proverbs and as we've kind of landed on this particular text, um, the reality is we all want to know where we're going in life, right? I hope all of us, we would love to know. We'd love to be able to see five years, ten years, maybe in 20 years down the road, what does this look like? Am I going to be with this guy or this girl sitting next to me? Am I not? Am I going to have this job? Am I going to finish school ever? Is it ever going to get easier? I mean, all these things that we would love to just have the answers to. And the truth is sometimes we don't, right? But the reality is we all are going to pose this question at some point, and, and, and hopefully you will, and it's what is God's will for my life? What, what am I supposed to do? And hopefully you're looking up going, what does he want me to do? And what we're going to discover tonight and how we're going to walk through this is, is this. To find God's will in your life, you must be walking with him. To find God's will in your life, you must be walking with him. And so what we want to do tonight is walk you through what it would look like. Proverbs, the part of Proverbs that we're at, is going to give us a beautiful picture of what it looks like to walk with God. And so as we pursue this text tonight, and as we understand what it looks like to walk with God, my prayer is that you would walk out of here either confirming that you're on that path, and you would just have trust that the Lord is going to move you in the direction that he wants to go. Or for some of us, maybe this would be the time when it's time to say, I need to back up, I need to get on the train, and I need to start walking with the Lord so I can begin to discover what it is that he has in store for me. So that's where we're going, and that's that's our pursuit. And uh, Last week, we talked about a couple of things, and I just want to recap because they're all really important. And the first one is we talked about wisdom is knowledge and action, okay? You can have all the knowledge in the world, but you're not wise until you can take that information and live it out, right? So wisdom is knowledge and action. The other thing we talked about is that Proverbs are foundational truths, okay? Proverbs are great foundation. They're great things you can live by, but you need to understand that they are not always perfect, And really, it's because situations change. For instance, it says a friend loves at all times. Can anyone openly and honestly say you love every single friend at all times? You can't. Don't try. Okay, most of us can't. So the reality is there are situations where that in theory is true. And so we pursue that, but there's also situations that are different. For instance, Scripture tells us that if we live in accordance to God's word, that we'll live a long and prosperous life. Well, in essence, that's true. But I've also known a lot of good young people that have followed the Lord and they passed away at a young age. And so these are foundational truths. It means they're true, but situations change. You just need to know that we're going to see a little bit of that tonight. The other thing we talked about last week is having a healthy fear of the Lord. Y'all remember this? Having a healthy fear of the Lord. Healthy like a parent, okay? And I know not all your parents' situations were perfect. I understand that. But in an ideal situation, a healthy fear of your parent would be, you know that if I do this, There's going to be repercussions for this bad decision. There's going to be discipline, right? We don't like it. We don't want it. But we know that that's there. And because that discipline's there, it pushes us. Hopefully, some of you didn't care. That was me too. But hopefully, it pushes you into the path that you would say, I'm going to stay on the straight 
and narrow. And on the other end, you have this incredible grace and this incredible mercy. That the reality is all of us, none of you kids were perfect, myself included. And so when we make mistakes, though our parents discipline us, they bring us back with love, with grace, and with mercy. And God works the same way. And so we serve a God that is disciplined and he is firm, but at the same time, he loves and he has grace and he has mercy. And we need to know that as we move forward through Proverbs, a healthy fear of the Lord. Okay, let's begin. Proverbs 3, verse 1. Point 1 tonight is this. There's four points, okay? Normally there's three. Tonight there's four. We're going to mix it up. Do you have ADD? Hang in there. Number 1, trust God's word. Point number 1 tonight, trust God's word. Here's the verse. My son, Do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for a length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Now, the first thing you need to see, this is not talking about length of days, years of life, and peace they will add in reference to heaven and hell. Okay, this is not talking about this is the way to heaven. Okay, there we know, there's no, hopefully you know this, if not, let me teach you this. There is nothing physically we can do to get to heaven. There's no action you can do, you can't be a good enough person or a good enough girl or a good enough guy. Nothing we can do to get to heaven is by God's grace and his mercy and his grace and mercy alone. So you need to know that. This is actually a physical reference to your body. Because when we trust God's word, it guides us and it protects us. It guides us and it protects us. But we have to have trust in the word to do that. So, for instance, some of you guys, we're going to get a little bit deeper in this in a second. Some of you guys think you got your life all mapped out. And you know exactly what you want to do. And the truth is, when you think about the word, you go, oh, that's a good book. Yeah, it's got some good stuff. Yeah, that crazy guy, Chad. Yeah, yeah, but but I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. You're not letting the Lord through the text guide you. Others of you, others of us, myself included, sometimes, and back in my past, long time, my BC days before Christ, We don't let the Bible protect us, right? The Bible wasn't set to be a bunch of rules and regulations that you must follow this and that's how you get to heaven. It's actually the opposite. It's like a parent. It says, hey, I'm going to lay these things in front of you, and if you'll obey them, it'll protect you. It'll keep you safe, and it'll guide you. But you have to have trust in the word to believe this. And it's interesting. As I was preparing for this, in this moment, I was going to just kind of pause the message and talk directly to people that are going away to college sometime soon. Raise your hand if that's you. One day you're going to go to a university that's, you know, maybe even if it's just like U of H. Okay, don't be shy. Y'all are always shy. Get up how I am proud. Okay. At first I was going to just talk to you guys. And then this week some things happened. I'm not going to go into full detail, but some things happened and I realized that this, this little encouragement is not just for them. It's for all of us. And it's this. Okay. When we get out of the house, Okay, when you get out of your house, out of your parents' house or your grandparents' house or aunts or uncles, wherever you're staying now, when you get out of the house, one of the first things most people want to do is flee from all parental guidance. Can I get an amen in the house? Okay, this side needs, okay, good. All right, that's the first thing we want to do, right? Mom made me do this, mom made me do that, I didn't like this. I want to be free and you run and what do you do? You run into a wall every time. Tweet that. You run into a wall. Why? Because when we pull away from the guidance, we get off track. And so I wanted to insert her because i got to be honest with you. We have watched through our church family a lot of kids grow up through the student ministry. And then they go away to college and they do exactly this. They run away from all parental, all ministry guidance. And they end up, literally, there have been students that have ended up dead. And I'm not exaggerating. And so in that moment, I was like, I need to stop. And I just want to warn them. And then... I ran into the guy, a guy this week that I hadn't seen in years. He was a part of this ministry, and he went through a deep, dark time. And, and the reality is he pulled away from the godly guidance. This guy wasn't a college student. This guy was in the professional world, CPA, and just hit rock bottom. And I realized this, this little warning, it isn't just for the guys going to college. It's for all of us. Man, when we get out of the house, the first thing we want to do is run from parental guidance. We want to run from biblical guidance. And the reality is that's where we should run to. The fifth commandment tells us, honor your father and mother. You will live a long life. It's truth there. And some of us don't like it. And I get it. I didn't like coming home at midnight. I understand that. But the reality is when we run from guidance, we find ourselves in trouble. Verse 3, it says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Have unwavering love and faithfulness. And what it's saying is on the inside and on the out. Bind them around your neck on the outside. Write them on the tablet of your heart on the inside. 
And a way to gauge this is think about work. All right, how many of you guys are working right now? It doesn't matter what kind of job you're working. Okay, most of you guys. Awesome. What are two great qualities to have? Who said that? Well done. Well done. Paying attention. Love and faithfulness. Right? No one wants to work with a person that doesn't love you. Now, you may not be hugging them. Guys in there kind of freaking out right now. I don't understand. You're not hugging and kissing, but we want love. You want compassion. Like, dude, I, I, I'll work with you. Even though you've got a lot of problems and there's a lot of things going on right now, but I'm going to work with you because I want to be that guy. I want to be that girl. Whatever. There's love there. But then there's also what? Faithfulness. What does your employer want from you? Faithfulness, especially if they're in their 40s and 50s. Loyalty is one of the biggest things amongst that generation. They want your faithfulness. You be faithful in your job, you'll keep a job for a long time. Love and faithfulness. And it says, look, this is, gives you favor and sight, both in God and man. It says, God, why? Because God wants us to love. It's the greatest commitment. Love your God with all your heart. And then what? Love your neighbor. Love. And then you be faithful. Faithful to God. Faithful to the scriptures. Faithful to what he's called you to do in the, his will for your life. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Second point. Trust God's prompting. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And the truth is, and I need to hear this, we were not made to understand God's plan, just to trust it. We were not made to understand God's plan for us, just to trust it. You get that? We don't like it. It's not always good, but it's truth. And the problem is many of us are trying to play God. I won't ask you to raise your hand because I know this would be a weird moment. But the truth is, we're trying to play God. When it comes to our schooling, for those of you that are in school, you're trying to play God. I want that degree because why? It's going to make me a lot of money. Why do you want a lot of money? So I can give back to my family and buy a house and a boat and a car and another car and then a lake house. And then, um, yeah, but for my family, right? But we're playing God. We're pursuing our degree. And and it may not be just for money. You're pursuing it because it's easy. You're pursuing it because it's the only thing that makes sense to you. But look at what it says. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. What God wants to do in your life, you are not going to get. You are not going to understand. It's not going to make sense. But if we're faithful to follow through, his will for our life is always better. And some of you are playing God in work. Especially some of you first year or two out of college. Right? The bosses always look at you like you're just a little person, right? They don't care about what you have to say. They don't care about what you think. You go, man, I went to school. I graduated. I got a degree. I should should be something. And you're just a little guy in the corner if you're lucky. And you go, God doesn't want this for me. This can't be right. And you may have this thought that I'm going to bail out. Let me tell you something. God may be refining you in that moment. God may be preparing you. But the reality is we trust in him and not our own understanding. You, can, you will most likely not make sense of what God wants to do in your life. And that's confirmation because it happened to me. I never dreamed I'd be standing here in front of you ever, never, ever, ever. We never trust our own understanding. We always trust in the Lord. We trust God's prompting. Verse 6, it says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. This means every area of life. See, some of us are really good. We talked about this before, compartmentalizing our lives. Right? We'll give God this, this, and this, but I'm going to hang on to this because I'm not quite ready to let this go. Ever been there? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. You wouldn't. Right? There's all these things that we're willing to give up. But there's always these one or two things. Some of you guys, it's serious, man. It's pornography. It's your dating relationships. Others of you, it's your career. It's your education. Maybe it's the way you treat people. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's history, whatever. But we have all these things, and we go, I'll give you this, this, and this, but I'm not ready to let this go. But God says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to walk with me, you must acknowledge me in every way. That means you give up every single part of your life. Some of us are really good at playing church on Thursday and Sunday. But, man, when we leave these doors, it's like we totally forget what we just experienced. Man, church is a launching pad into life. It's a launching pad into your school. It's a launching pad into work. But we get caught compartmentalizing. God, I'll give you this and I'll give you this, but I'm I'm not ready to give you this. I'm not ready to give you this. I want so badly to be married. I don't because I'm married. It's cool. But a lot of men, we, we want that. We want to be married. We want to be married. I can't be single. It's not God's plan for me. Trust me. It's not. I can't be single. And the reality is we get caught forcing it. 
and you missed out on what he's trying to do. I've told you all this before, man. If I'd met Sarah four years before I did, she'd have walked right on by. Why? Because God was refining me. He was getting me ready. I had to give up that part of my life. Actually, it was my whole life because I was messed up. But I had to give up my life so that he could work in me. So then when I stepped in front of her, she could look at me and go, whoa, he's the one. That didn't happen, but it sounded really cool. But this is what it looks like. We give God every part of our life. Some of you guys are hanging on. You need to let go. Verse 7, it says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Fear the Lord. Remember that. We're going to see that all the way through. It says healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. That is a literal translation. When we obey God, he takes care of us. 60% of illness is caused by stress, fear, guilt, or sorrow. So the next time you're sick, you might want to just step back and check and see if any one of those were the cause of it. You probably won't know because I don't really know how they got this, but it was a legitimate site when I saw the site. I probably just took back all credibility, sorry. 60% of all illness is caused by stress, fear, guilt, and sorrow. And then you take into account what alcohol, tobacco, and sex can do. Right? Alcohol, what does it do? Kills your liver. Kills your liver. Tobacco, emphysema, lung cancer, the list goes on. Sex, AIDS, just sexually transmitted diseases in general. And we look at that and we go, man, you're right. When I pull away from God's protection, the things that he's guiding me in, I realize how dangerous this can be. But, man, when we, when we follow him, when we trust his prompting, we notice that we can have healing to our flesh and refreshment to our bones. Point number three, share God's blessings. Honor the Lord, verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And you go, huh? How does this have anything to do with finding God's will in my life and moving forward? Let me tell you something. When we, and this, this was kind of a revelation that I had as I was studying this. When we give to God, it prepares our hearts for what he wants to do with us. When we give, it's like complete submission. I, I'm trusting you with this. And as I'm trusting you with this, I'm preparing for what it is that you want me to do. Isn't that crazy? As we give to God, it is part of the preparation that he uses in our life to prepare us for what he wants to do. And it says, give the first fruits. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's referenced back in olden times. There, we have money now. It's, a little, it's more cash friendly these days. But back then it was produce. And so what they would do is they would sell all the good produce first. And then with whatever it was left that wouldn't quite sell, then they would give it to God. Right? And for some of us, it doesn't work that way because money doesn't really lose value. But the reality is some of us will wait until maybe we pay all our bills. Even if you just take $10, it's okay. We wait until we pay all our bills. We get everything done. And then if there's anything left, then I'll maybe put it in the offering plate at my church. Or the other part of this, it says give your first fruits. Think of this. Maybe the Lord wants to use a little bit more that month. Maybe at the beginning of the month and you say, okay, here's my whatever percentage you decide to give, and that's between you and the Lord. But when I give this, the Lord may say, hey, you know what? There's a project going on at your church. Hey, there's an organization that I want you to go help. I want you to go be a part of that. I want you to give a little extra money this month because I want you to help them. But if we wait till the end and we use it all up and then whatever's left, see, we miss out on the moment. And so we give our first fruit so God gets the best and he gets what's needed. And then verse 10 says, then your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will be bursting with wine. And some of us read that and get really excited because if I give, that means I'm going to get rich. Man, where's the plate? But I got to tell you, it doesn't work that way. God never guarantees money. But he guarantees that he'll take care of us and that he'll bless us. And some of us, blessing, we need to just realize, get this through our heads. Blessing isn't always in the form of money. Some of you will make a lot of money, and that's great. And some of you won't, like me. I tell this all the time. The Lord knows. I, technology kills me. I see TVs. I just want to buy them all. So the Lord just decided, Chad, you're going to be a pastor. I'm not going to give you a chance to buy them. Someone could give them to you from underground. That would be really cool. You know, they could show up one day. Just kidding. But the Lord knows that. He understands how I function, all right? And, and you know, that may change one day. But the reality is right now, that's the truth. And so he knows that. But, man, it says, I, he, he your vats will be filled with plenty, or your vats will be filled bursting with wine, and your barns will be filled with plenty. You go, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to be blessed if I'm broke? And I'll tell you. How many of you guys were here when we did the 127 Watch Project? A couple of you guys. Good. So a couple, uh, was it two years ago, a year ago? I don't know. Two years ago. 
we did a watch project. And so what we did is you can see some of it on the screen. We sold these watches in our lobby. And you guys bought them. Okay, we realized you weren't broke or you went broke buying these. I don't really know how to gauge that. But it doesn't matter. We raised over $5,000 in three nights, right? Three nights. Three underground nights. We raised over $5,000. Okay, let the video finish. Just stop it. They got the picture. Now listen to me. Can you imagine the kind of party we could have had with five grand? The Christmas party would have been even more off the chain. It would have been crazy. We could have done a lot of stuff, man. We could have bought some new equipment or, I don't know, we could have done a lot. But you know what we did with every penny? We bought those mattresses. We bought 40 of them. Mattresses and box springs. Every single penny was spent. And we showed up to that place and we dropped them off. Can I tell you something? For those of us that were there, right, it was the greatest blessing in return we could have ever received. No party, no piece of equipment, nothing would have ever compared to that moment when we took what you guys gave and we gave it back. And so what does it look like to be blessed? It looks like that. It's not about money. It's about what the Lord does and works through. Some of you, man, if you're faithful, the Lord's going to use that. He's, he's going to bless you with family. He's going to bless you with a wife or a husband. That's important. All right? It's not for everybody, but it's going to be for most of you guys. He'll bless you with kids. Maybe those kids will be good. Maybe they won't, but that's not the point. They're going to be a blessing, okay? We don't know. Emma, the jury's still out. We're not sure how she's going to turn out, but we're praying. We're praying. She prays a lot, too. I like that. That's good. Okay, anyways, let, let's move on. But you get the point. It's all about the blessing. It's not about money. And so we give to the Lord so he can prepare our hearts to show us what it is that he wants us to do. Last point tonight is this. We submit to God's discipline. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. And the truth is discipline has a really bad rap. It really does. We hear discipline and we go, oh, my God, you're in trouble. You did it. You're wrong. And the reality is discipline is just teaching and protecting. It's teaching and protecting. It's teaching. It's training. Hey, your dad, all right, didn't want to get swatted. All right, don't have to answer that. It's cool. I can see how that would be awkward. Your dad swatted you back in the day. Maybe now. Some of you probably need it. It's cool. Your dad swatted you. Why? Because he wanted to teach you a lesson. It's not because he enjoyed that. Now, he might have to an extent. That's a different story. He's got to pray about that. But the reality is he swatted you. And most parents, what do they do? They say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right? And you know what? In that moment, you're going, yeah, right. I'm going to get you when I get bigger. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. We could probably bring Frank up here right now. You don't have to. If we had time, I would. And he would probably say the same thing, man. I don't know if they're spanking Emma yet. I'm not really sure. But when the time comes, I promise you it's going to hurt him more than it's going to hurt her. Because that's his baby, Frank. I hope it does. All right. That's his baby. That's his little girl that he's watched raise. And so, man, when that happens, when the Lord does this to us, when he disciplines, he disciplines us with love because he cares about us. And he wants what's best for you. And so some of you make some bad choices and discipline comes and you don't understand why and you don't like it. But the reality is it's because the Lord loves you that he's allowing these things to happen to you. And you know what? That's easier said than done. And in the moment, you're going to hate it. But the reality is no matter how much God's discipline may hurt us, it will never harm us. Why? Because God disciplines with love every time. No matter how much it may hurt us, it will never harm us because God always disciplines with love. Now I'm going to close with this. I'm going to go through quickly and just we answered the question, how do I know God's will for my life? And I just want to recap this quickly. The first thing is this. You must give full commitment of yourself. Full commitment. That's in salvation starting a relationship and sustaining a relationship with Jesus Christ through following him and moving toward the Lord. You trust him with your salvation and you trust him with the direction of your life. It's full commitment. God, whatever you want. You want this dating relationship? It's yours. You want this job? It's yours. You want this education? It's yours. Whatever you want. You want all my money this month? It's yours. I don't know how I'm going to make it, but I trust you. It's total commitment. The second one is there must be a, a healthy distrust of self. Throughout as you just recognize, I don't know everything. In fact, most of us don't know anything when it comes to what the Lord has in store. And you acknowledge that. And you have discernment and, you, you know, you feel when things are right and wrong. But the reality is we trust that the Lord, he's got total control. Total control. And we trust him. It's a healthy distrust of self. And then the third thing, the last thing, is God must be Lord of your life. 
That means every area surrendered to him. We talked about that. There can't be anything hanging back. Every area surrendered to him. Every area. Dating, addiction, whatever it is, it must be totally surrendered to him. This is what it looks like to walk with the Lord. And when we walk with the Lord, this is how we discover his will for our life. So for me, uh, my journey quickly um, started at this church. I came here, was messed up, doing a bunch of stupid things uh, that we don't need to go through, and we've done it before. Tons of bad decisions. I came to this church just like a lot of you guys. It showed up. Cool. Not sure I even like church, but I'm here, so let's, let's just see what this thing's about. Started coming. Started to enjoy it. It's kind of cool. Started connecting with the Lord. Sort of realized, man, there's something here. I, I want more of this. I don't know what it is. It still kind of scares me. I see people, like, raising their hands. I'm not quite sure I know how to handle this, but, but I want to pursue this. And so I began, and I began, and I started to serve. And it was in my time serving at this church that the Lord truly drew me to him. And I tell that to anyone that asks. It was when I began to serve, not when I sat in a chair, but when I started to serve that the Lord began to draw me to him. And as he drew me to him, I watched my life literally change. And then came Sarah. And I saw this girl. You know, she was cute. I wasn't interested. So I decided I was done. Wasn't doing that anymore. But the Lord had other plans. So we started hanging out. We started talking. We weren't dating yet. Follow this carefully. We were just talking. We hung out. We played flag football together, and she dominated. And I was like, uh-oh, this, isn't, this is good. <laughs> Side note. And then we got to this point where we said, hey, you know what? This might have a future. Maybe we need to pursue this. And so you know what we did? It was her idea, not mine. I wish I could say it was. She said, we're not going to talk for three weeks. Okay. Whatever you want, babe. So we did. For three weeks, we didn't talk. We saw each other at church because you couldn't avoid that. But we didn't talk. And the whole goal was that we would just pray through those days and through those weeks. And at the end, it takes 21 days to break a habit. At the end of those 21 days, if we still were interested in each other, feel like the Lord was still moving us, then we would move forward. We finished those 21 days. We both felt it. We moved forward. We began to date. A few months later, I got called into ministry here at the church full time. It was my first job. My first career began. Now, this is crazy. Okay, you got to see this. Life before, life now. Who would have thought? No one, especially people that knew me back then. But the Lord began to call me, began to call me. And the church started talking, hey, maybe we want to bring this guy. And I was thinking, like, this is awesome, like serving people, loving on people, hanging out with people, talking about God. This is the coolest thing ever. I want to do this forever and get paid so I can live. I want to do this. I want to do this. And I started running around like a little kid. I was just like, can you hire me? Can you hire me? I just want to be here. I just want to serve Jesus. Come on. What's wrong with you? Some things happened and moved forward, and the moment came where they offered me a job. And I said yes. It had been an ongoing process. The Lord had been working, the Lord had working. I was thankful that the church was slow. I wasn't thankful at the time. We know I, I wasn't thankful, but in the end, I'm so thankful that they took their time so that I could take my time. And when the time came, the moment was right, and I started my career. And then, a little while later, it came time for Sarah and I to talk about that next step. Da, 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 da. No, it was a great moment. It was great. We started talking about it. Yeah, is this something we really want to do? I mean, we've been dating now for four years. Take notes. Four years. Is this what we want to do? Do we want to get married? Do we want to spend the rest of our life with each other? Do you want to wake up and look at me for the rest of your life? Is this what you want? I didn't ask that. Don't do that either. But we talked through it. And we prayed through it, and we talked through it, and we prayed through it, we talked through it, we prayed through it, and I spent a lot of time praying to God and a lot of time on my knees. I tell you, ladies, before he ever gets on a knee to you, he better be on a knee to the Lord, period, period. I spent a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in prayer, and it was evident that it was time to make my move, to ask her to marry me. And she said yes, and we got married. And that's my journey up to now. That's what I want you to see. What was it? It wasn't some, that's the decision. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's the will you have for me. Let's go. It was a process. It was when I started to walk with the Lord that he began to show me his will for my life. A lot of us want it now. We've been trained to get it now, to get it now. I want that answer now. Ask Oprah, ask Twitter, whatever. I'm going to get my answer now. That's not the way. Sometimes the Lord moves that way. Sometimes he does. But most of the time he doesn't. He's a patient God, and we need to be patient people. You trust him. 
If you will walk with him, you will begin to see these things unfold. And that, I promise you, if you try the other way, I can't guarantee it'll work. I can't. But if we'll walk with him, he will show us his will for our life. And that's what this ministry is about, guys. We're not about getting up here and entertaining you. and say, That's not what it's about. We want to walk with you, and we want to help you get there, whatever that looks like. So some of you tonight need to ask for help. Some of you might need to ask for prayer. Some of you might need to ask Jesus to come into your life. But whatever it is, let's start that tonight so we can begin this journey and all of us can discover what God's will is for our life. Amen.